Here we go. Here we go. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Two Tongues Podcast. Podcast for today, I'm wearing a bow tie. Uh, anybody not checking this out on YouTube, maybe you want to go check it out because I'm wearing a bow tie. I want to be taken seriously today. This is my professorial look, uh, but really, no. Uh, the other day, I had a uh, suit coat on, and Kyle mentioned that it looked dapper. So, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about uh, the dress code on the podcast, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll be a little bit more formal. Uh, today, we're going to do some more opinion scholarship. I don't know what you guys thought about the C.S. Lewis episode uh, on Out of the Silent Planet. Uh, I really liked it, not as much as the next book, and I'm hoping Kyle will come on and do uh, do the follow-up with me on uh, Paralandra, which is the second book. Definitely a bit of a divergence from our normal talking points, but we're going to get back to it today. We're going to get back into Ed Edinger's um, the Psyche and Antiquity that uh, we've been talking about, uh, or I've been teeing up. These are the pre-Socratic philosophers and um, the interesting shit that they said uh, that's metaphysical um, and that has direct relevance to the type of psychology, that depth psychology that Carl Jung um, established that Ed Edinger is following kind of following in that in that path. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and we'll get back to C.S. Lewis maybe next week or the following, something like that. This episode I'm going to call Seeking the RK, when philosophy was mysticism. I don't know how you feel about that. I thought it was clever. Seeking the RK, this is really what we're going to do today. I'm going to cover about half of the book today, and it's about 100 years of history. So what we're going to talk about today is the ancient Greek philosophers, for at least the notable ones, from the late 500s BC to the late 400s BC. Um, this covers really the most ancient philosophers that we know of, most of which is just fragments. We don't have whole books. We have only fragments to go on. And so we're going to do our best. But there's just some really great shit here. And um, at some point when I'm finished with Edinger, uh, there's another small book that I found that goes over some of those fragments, at least on a couple of the philosophers, that I think is worth taking a dive on. What I thought was the most interesting and most unexpected in doing this research is finding that the earliest Greek philosophers were shamans and mystics. They were, they were characters that were associated with the mystery religions, and those are suspected to be cults of psychedelic drug use, essentially, religious uh, rituals that had to do with psychedelic drug use. And so it's very mystical. And so much about what we're going to talk about today um, has parallels in ancient Egyptian religion, but also in ancient Indian, like Vedanta and some of that, that you know, the ancient uh, Indian religion from the Upanishads. You'll see it as we start talking about it. But it's really, really interesting. All right, so I want to give you a little bit of the intro here to the book before we dive into the philosophers themselves. Remember, Edinger is going to focus on things they said that have the most relevance for psychology or depth psychology. So that's what we're going to focus on. It happens to be the stuff I find the most interesting, so there, there it is. All right, so without further ado, Edinger says, The early Greek philosophers had just stepped out of the mists of participation mystique with nature. This means that their concepts and images are laden with numinosity. Similar to the great Hebrew prophets, they were gripped by the numinosity of archetypal images and were attempting to conceptualize them. It is my premise that philosophy, like religion, is the phenomenology of the psyche revealing itself. All right, so there's a ton there in this first paragraph. So... In the end, when he says that religion, religion and philosophy are both this, the phenomenology of the psyche revealing itself, what he's saying is that religion and philosophy are, are psychology, that what they really are are paths to understanding what it means to be a psyche, what it means to be a sentient being, what it means to be conscious, um, and that religious stories are telling the story of consciousness. The birth of the cosmos is the story of the birth of consciousness. And there's lots of really compelling reasons why this makes sense. Um, at least there's a lot of overlap in these mythological ideas. 
So this is an interesting point, and, and so I want to start there. But let me back up and talk about what, what this means when he says that the Greeks, the early Greeks, had just stepped out of the mists of participation mystique with nature. What the hell does that mean? So participation mystique is means exactly what you think it means. Participation, a mystical participation in nature. It was a worldview, an ancient worldview, a primitive worldview, but it still exists in you know, in places today, and maybe should exist more, um, a worldview where human beings imagine themselves as one with the process of nature. You know, we're all part of the cycle of nature. We're all part of the cosmos. Um, you know, we're all one thing in some very mystical way. And that in our early, the early part of our evolution, we had to evolve a new way of thinking. We began like much like an animal, like an unconscious animal. We're, we're living in the world um, in a co- kind of cause and effect sort of way. All of our actions are instincts. We're instinctively living in the world. We don't have a will exactly. We don't do what we want. We do what we do, right? We're, we're simply responding to nature, responding to our instincts, the cause and effect. And we're part of this causal chain with nature. Nature does this, we do that. Nature does this, we do that. We don't have a choice in the matter. And you see that when you see how deer behaves or how turkey behaves or how, you know, wild animals behave in in nature. They don't have a will. It's, It's something like that. But when human beings had a psychology that was like that, where we felt more a part of nature and, uh, um, when we were in that state of mind, we were closer to the unconscious. This is the argument. We were closer to our unconscious origins, to the way that our state of mind was before we became fully modern, before we became fully human, before we became fully self-conscious. And if we can step back into that place where we were closer and more familiar with the way we used to be, the way we used to see ourselves in the world, that there's like really valuable pieces of information there that we gave up at our peril. So these early Greek philosophers have important things to say because of their proximity to this older state of mind, this older, more primitive psychology. It's the reason why their religious stories and their histories are all blended together. It's like the, the, the supernatural realm and the natural realm weren't different to them. And as it became more different as they got more sophisticated, um, you know, in their thinking, strange things happened. And the strangest thing of all was this change in the way that that human beings see that themselves and their role in the cosmos. So he says, this means that their concepts and images are laden with numinosities. All this means is the ancient Greeks were closer to this unconscious state of mind, this instinctual state of mind. And so the images that they have access to these unconscious images that they have access to, maybe we don't have access to them quite quite as much in the modern world. Maybe they had some special insight into those things. And so that's what he's calling images that are laden with numinosity. That just means that they seem supernatural, divine, special. Something's going on with these images that draws our attention, makes us wildly curious about them. I mean, I have that feeling with the idea of God in general. It's a, it's such a fascinating concept to me. I can barely stand it. And it's been that way for me my whole life. You say God and my ears perk up. Like, what do you mean by that? I want to know what ideas do you connect to that? Why? Where do they come from? It's fascinating to me. I can't even explain to you why it's so gripping to me, but it is. It's numinous to me, that idea. I'm sure there's something numinous to you if you think about it hard enough. And we're going to talk about some of those today. And maybe you can get on board. Then he makes this comparison that the pre-Socratic philosophers were something like the Hebrew prophets. There were people who were bringing images from conscious information of God to human beings, to the conscious realm of human beings. And that's how we should see um, the Greek philosophers in the same way we look at these the prophets from the Bible. Also another interesting idea. He says, the overriding interest 
of the Greek philosophers was in what lies beyond the visible world. It is remarkable to see that the dawning rational consciousness of our species made the assumption that there is something beyond what one can see. That assumption demonstrates the projection of the psyche, which lies behind sensible concrete existence. So what he's saying here is something interesting. It's, it's like maybe an explanation for why people come up with the idea of God at all because we have this experience of our psyche and a part of it we don't understand, this unconscious part of it that we seem detached from. And I can I can bring it down to earth. I've done it before. I can bring that idea down to earth, but not without sacrificing something important. So let me just do it anyway. When I say that there's an unconscious part of ourselves that we're not really aware of or, or conscious of, that makes perfect sense. We call it unconscious. What do I mean by that? So if I asked you a question like, where do your interests come from? Why is it that I'm so interested in God as opposed to, you know, anything else? Where do your interests come from? The truth is, you don't have any fucking idea, and neither do I. Why are my interests different from yours? Why is something interesting at all? And why to me specifically? We have no idea. It's because it's unconscious. Whatever it is that draws me to something, that makes it compelling to me, we have no idea. None. It's unconscious. How about the way that my heart is beating, the way that I'm breathing right now? I'm not trying to do it. I'm not aware that I'm doing it. I'm just doing it. It's unconscious. How about falling asleep? Can you explain to me how you fall asleep? Of course not, because it's an unconscious thing. And your instincts are like that as well. You know, maybe you're a timid person, generally pretty easygoing. You find yourself in a situation where you have to be aggressive. Maybe you're protecting your children or something, and you turn into a beast you didn't know you were, you didn't know you had in you. How do you explain that? It's unconscious. It's an unconscious reality, something that's potential within you. And it, what that means is very difficult to understand. The fact that some part of you exists that you don't have access to is baffling. And numinous, it should fill you with this idea of spirit and a, an a, 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 a attachment and identity with the spirit that is not scientific, it's not rational or logical, but it's undeniable. And it's this numinous thing. So he's saying something like this. So the idea that there's something beyond what we see and touch in the world. There's some reality behind it. Um, that's an interesting, it seems like a modern idea. It seems like the movie, The Matrix or something. But the truth is, this is a very old idea. That when we look out at the world around us, we see and experience something. But whether that something is what's real, we don't know. And we've been questioning that since the beginning of human history. And that's interesting. So he says, that there is something beyond what one can see, and that that assumption demonstrates the projection of the psyche, which lies behind sensible concrete existence. So we know we have this unconscious bit of ourselves. Because we feel detached from it, he's saying what we do psychologically is we project it into the world. It, it, does, it must not belong to me. It must be out there. It must be the gods that are keeping my heart beating. It must be the gods that are keeping me breathing. It must be the gods that control the storms, you know, the things that I don't understand, the mysteries that seem detached from me. And so I project them out there, and suddenly the world is filled with spirits and gods, that kind of a thing. And what it is we mean when we say the gods are out there, we mean that we recognize there is something beyond what we can see and touch. Maybe that thing is within us and part of us. Maybe it's out there, but we know something's going on. And so this is the evidence, this is the suspicion of a spiritual reality that exists. And it's simply a recognition, an awareness of our unconscious psyche, an unconscious part of ourself, something more than what we believe ourselves to be, and yet we, are, we can't be detached from. Amazing. Now he brings up a scholar named John Burnett, who's a scholar of ancient Greek philosophy. And John Burnett said, Greek philosophy 
is based on the faith that reality is divine and that the soul can enter into communion with it. So faith that reality is divine. Now, does that seem like an ancient Greek idea? I mean, it seems pretty distant from Aristotle. But as I learned these more, these more ancient Greek philosophers, these are mystics and shamans. And fuck yeah, that's right up their alley. And that the soul can enter into communion with it, to me, is a relic of those mystery religions that we talked about, of the shamanism that I alluded to. The idea that ancient primitive people had quests. You know, maybe maybe they spiritual quests. Maybe they encountered them through psychedelic experience, through sensory deprivation, through food, you know, food deprivation, or sleep deprivation, ecstatic ritual, whatever it was that they did to get themselves into this altered state of consciousness. And when they when they reached that altered state of consciousness, and this is the shamanistic path, they found themselves in communion with the spiritual reality that they suspected existed all along. And now they know that they can they can or are a part of it. He says, uh, Nietzsche observed that for the Greeks, philosophy was a way to study the archetypes. So Nietzsche believed that the ancient Greeks were studying the archetypes when they did philosophy. And then Edinger says that the purpose of the book is to track the psyche as it manifests itself in early philosophy. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to track the psyche as it manifests itself in early philosophy when these ancient Greeks were trying to grapple with that mystery, that unconscious reality that's a part of themselves. What did they make of it? What did they call it? How did they describe it? How did they build on each other's ideas to refine it and try to come up with the truth of what they were searching for? And that brings me to the first set of philosophers we're going to talk about. These are the Milesian philosophers. So Miletus, of course, is a city-state. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the right word. I, I associate that with the ancient Greeks. So uh, Miletus was a, a city. And um, a very famous philosopher comes from there. His name is Thales. And if you've uh, probably heard of Thales, um, very famous in the history of philosophy, but in the history of science as well. Um, but more than that, so let's begin with Thales. He lived around right around 585 BC. And then there was Anaximander, which was his student, who lived around 560. And then um, Anaximenes, which was the student of Anaximander, who lived around 546. I just want to say I love the names. Anaximander is a freaking awesome name. I love that. But what I want to get to here is that these three philosophers are um, master and student, master and student, master and student. So you have a very similar thing that we all are more familiar with that happened with Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, or you might say Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander the Great. All of those famous characters were master and student, like immediately following the other. And so we have something like that happening in Miletus, so something in the water there in Miletus, but Thales is, is where we're going to start, and he introduces these two concepts. In Greek, it's physis and arche. And we're going to talk a lot about Arche throughout. That's kind of what today is about. But let's talk about physis and Arche both. Physis is where we get the word physical, physics from, physis. In Latin, that became natura. And of course, in English, we use the word nature. So you can understand physis means something like nature. So when Thales brings this idea up, he's the first one to ever do it. What does he mean by this physis? So... It's used for the origin of something, but also to its nature, like the way something is its nature. It can refer to the generative power of the organic world, meaning something like to grow. So the origin or source of something, its nature, and this idea of to grow, all of these ideas um, are associated with its vices, nature. He says, as early as Aristotle, physis and God are mentioned in the same breath. So, so nature and God are something very, very similar in terms of ideas. And then finally, he says, physis refers to the order of things, an innate organic unity. So nature as in, you know, 
as in all of nature, as in the cosmos and all of the, all of its operations, labeling that nature, that kind of thing. And then he says, among the Stoics, Physis became a god of the universe. So Marcus Aurelius, who's the late Roman Stoic uh, emperor of Rome, he said, O oh, nature, from you comes everything. In you is everything. To you goes everything. So you can see uh, a, a parallel there, the way Marcus Aurelius talked about nature and the way that a modern uh, Christian would talk about God, the source of things, or even a, even a Hindu, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, creator, preserver, destroyer. That's, that's what Marcus Aurelius is saying. Oh, nature, from you comes everything, creator. In you is everything, preserver. To you goes everything, destroyer. Something like that, right? Then he says, Agnosticism, so this is early Christian uh, and, and a little before, there appears the image of Sophia. Sophia falling into the embrace of Physis. Now, Sophia is a divine personification of, uh, um, well, she, I'm not taking too much of the weeds here about Gnosticism, but the Gnostics associate with Sophia, and that just means wisdom, as the feminine um, aspect of God, and it was associated with the Holy Spirit. It's it's so Sophia, something like the Logos or the Holy Spirit, and and interestingly, they they saw Sophia falling into the embrace of Physes. What that means is the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of God, the breath of God, the thing that makes uh, that's breathed into Adam that makes that makes you alive. That thing that falls into the embrace of nature. I don't know what that sounds like to you, but it sounds to me like incarnation, right? The soul descending down into the physical and bringing it to life. He says, Jung identified the unconscious psyche with nature. So now we have this connection between the unconscious and nature. And remember, we're talking about nature in the context of something like God. So unconscious, nature, God. Something like that, okay? And Jung says, the products of the unconscious are pure nature. So he's talking about the archetypes. They're pure nature. So we have these archetypal forces that live within us. That's how Jung would describe it. And you know about, about those archetypal forces when you're possessed by it. So this is another incarnation motif. If you're angry, you know, and you get filled with rage and it takes over, it kind of takes over your personality and makes you act out in a way you wouldn't if you weren't in that position. It possesses you for a minute. And so you have these archetypal forces that, that, that make you act in a way that, that isn't conscious to you. It's not under your control, at least not exactly. And so he's saying that those things are pure nature. And you can see them embodied in animals when animals are doing their animal things. He's saying that somehow that's connected to what's behind nature in general. So the archetypes that govern our psychic development and our lives, our maturing as we grow older and all that, those are the same sorts of laws that govern gravity and you know molecular motion and all the natural things. Something like that that Young is, is getting at. All right, so the products of the unconscious are pure nature. He says, Young is reminding us that the ego is not a piece of nature. It is, in fact, contra natural, so contrary to nature. What is the ego? The ego is different from the unconscious. The ego is what we mean by being conscious. We'll become a subject that is conscious. That, you know, you and, you and I, that's our ego we're talking about. But that ego is attached to some greater reality. It's attached to some unconscious reality that we don't we don't really believe ourselves to be attached to, even though we know we are, because we're unconscious of it. That's part of the paradox. So to be, if, if the unconscious is pure nature, then the ego, then the conscious part is counter to nature. And if that seems strange to you, I want to try to help you by making it between will. So you look at an animal, cat sees a mouse run out in front of it. It just pounces. It just attacks and kills the mouse. It doesn't think about it. It doesn't want to kill the mouse. 
It doesn't try to kill the mouse. It just sees it and it acts. It just does what a cat does. That's an instinct. There's no will involved. The cat just does what it does like a machine. If it had a will, if it was self-conscious, then it could decide whether it wants to kill that mouse or not. The cat doesn't have that choice. Unless that cat has just eaten six mice and it literally can't move, it's going to kill that mouse when it sees it. So instinct is unconscious. Will is conscious, right? If instinct is nature, and you can see that in nature very easily. And you think, you know what, human beings aren't like that. There's something different. There's something unnatural about what it is to be human. This is what Jung is pointing out. Being conscious is contra natorum. It's something against nature. And that's interesting. All right, he says, consider psychologically, the discoverer of physis means that one has perceived the separation between subject and object, between ego and its surrounding environment. The most basic prerequisite for consciousness. Once there is an awareness that subject and object are two different entities, then a dialogue becomes possible between the ego, the subject, and nature, the object. Science becomes possible. Of course, we know science grew out of philosophy. It used to be called natural philosophy. All right, so let's get into this a little bit deeper. So he says that the discovery of nature implies a separation between subject and object, between ego and its environment, and that makes perfect sense. Like I, need to, I need to see myself as not a part of nature. I need to be able to step back from it so that I can see it, right? Whilst I'm in it, in that participation mystique we talked about earlier, while I feel like I'm part of nature, I don't have the, the separation, I don't have the distance I need to ever know what nature is. It's just a part of things. It's a part of me. It's what I'm a part of. But to be conscious is to, is to be a subject. It's to find yourself separate from the rest of, of reality. I'm a subject and everything else is an object. So the moment you become conscious, the moment the unconscious becomes conscious, there's this separation that occurs, some, some dramatic shift in that participation mystique worldview changes. And you have this modern worldview of a subject in an objective world, an ego surrounded by nature, right? And he says that's the most basic prerequisite for consciousness, right? I have to be a subject. I can't be one with the universe and be conscious. I have to be a subject in and of myself, separate from it, so that I can observe it and say, ah, that's what nature is. Can't you see it over there? Something like that. So consciousness is necessary for that. And then a dialogue becomes possible between the ego and nature. That's something like Something like prayer, you know, an attempt to communicate to God, an attempt to communicate with the unconscious. He goes on, he says, the other fundamental concept of the Milesians is the term arche. It means beginning, principle, original substance. Understood psychologically, these terms refer to the projection onto the material world of an original condition of the psyche. In this projection, the psyche announces that it derives from the unconscious. So before I go on, RK obviously is the root of the word archetype, which Jan will talk a lot about. Really, that's why we're talking about it now. The ancient Greeks, the pre-Socratics, they were the first to bring this idea to mind, to make a word for it, RK, the beginning, the, the principle, the original substance. And and Edinger is saying that this idea occurs to human beings because we have this tendency of projecting onto the world what we don't understand within ourselves, this unconscious mystery within ourselves. We, we, we don't feel like it belongs to us, so we imagine that, it, that it's out here. We project it onto the world. And it's the psyche telling us, he says announces, but it's the psyche communicating to us that it derives from the unconscious. We look around at the mystery of the world, we wonder, where did it come from? And the question we're asking is not, where did the world come from? 
It's where did we come from? Where did experience come from? Where did sentience come from? Because there's no difference to us between conscious experience and the world. There's no difference to us. It's the same thing. So the origin of the world and the origin of the psyche are the same question. And he goes on, he says, it is quite remarkable that the unity of the psychic self, this is a Jungian term, self, that kind of means something like God, that the unity of the self should be projected into the world. He says the world is obviously a multiplicity. There's lots of things in the world. The assumption that there is an original RK that lies behind the multiplicity is a daring one. No one argued about the basic assumption that there was one thing as an origin. Rather, they argued about the nature of the one thing. So what is he saying here? He's saying it's absolutely amazing that these ancient people would look at the world around them and see all these distinct things. The world is made of a multiplicity of things. And imagine that with all these things that exist, they must have all come from one thing. And there are reasons why you can imagine you might think that. I mean, if you observe um, children being born, you know, well, my grandfather had my father, and my father, my father and mother had me, and so on and so forth. You can see that you can kind of rewind the clock, and you can kind of, you know, um, uh, fold everything back up to some original starting point. And that, that seems logical enough. But difficult to imagine that these ancient people would come up with such an idea. Very practical people, you know, living hand to mouth. Very strange. And it's strange to him because Edinger's basically saying it's not strange. He's saying that's just part of the reality of being a human. It might seem strange that they would come up with such an idea at such an early stage, but when you think about the reality of what it is to be human, not so strange, really. And no one argued, he said. Nobody in ancient Greece argued that there was only one origin for everything just seemed natural, true. They did argue about what that one thing is, and that's what we're going to do today. And that brings me back to Thales. Thales thought water was the arche, hydor in Greek. So one could say that the first Western philosopher believed the unconscious psyche is equivalent to water. It is a familiar image akin to the understanding of water symbolism in dreams. So if you don't know what water symbolizes in dreams, this is something that Jung talked about, his students talked about, um, but lots of lots of people. Um, that, that water, when it appears in dreams, very often has a connection to the unconscious. And you might wonder why. And I, to me, it seems pretty obvious. The water is the endless deep. You know, the ocean, the sea, that's the endless deep. Those are the words from the Bible, by the way. In the beginning, it was the abyss, the endless deep. And our earliest myths, like the, the Babylonian story, the Sumerian stories of, of uh, the world parents, the original god and goddess that create the cosmos, Tiamat and Apsu. Tiamat was the salt water, Apsu, the fresh water. Right? So you see water uh, in myths and in dream interpretation. It represents something like the unconscious. That's the origin of all things. It's the origin of consciousness. And so for us, again, there's no difference between the origin of consciousness and the cosmos. They're the same thing to us. And so Thales thought, ah, it must be water. Water must be the arcade that everything was born from. And that brings me to his, his student, Anaximander. Now, Anaximander held that the arcade was the Aperion, which means the boundless. It announces that the unconscious is fundamentally infinite. Jung remarked, quote, the decisive question for man is, is he related to something infinite or not? Our experience of the unconscious leads to implications of this sort. The self is beyond the limits of the ego. And therefore, for the ego, it is infinite. And Examander said, things perish into those things out of which they have their birth. 
So his understanding is that the multiplicity of differentiated things is born out of an original aperion. The aperion first gives birth to the four elements. Then the individual things arise from various mixtures. And then when these objects perish, they return to the four elements from which they came. So to Anaximander, the, the RK wasn't water. It was something boundless and infinite. Whatever that is, the aperion, whatever that is, it, just, it, it, it is something that is boundless and infinite. And his student here, Anaximenes, announced that the RK, the first principle, was air. So we started, we started with water, we get to this aperion, this boundlessness, and now we get to air. Why air? So he says, probably because it's connection with breath and life and the belief that that was divine. He says the symbolism here is basically air, breath, wind, spirit, something like that. Very likely the imagery derives from primitive observations of what was called the breath soul. When a warrior died on the battlefield, he gave out his last breath. So there was this understanding that with the leaving of the breath, leaves the soul, leaves the life. And so Anaximenes said it must be air because that's associated with life and soul. It must be air that is the arche. Now that brings us to Pythagoras. So now we're leaving Miletus. Now Pythagoras lived around 538 BC. Uh, according to the surviving material, he had magical attributes, indicating that he was a shamanic figure. This is what I mean. I find this so fascinating that, that some of these early Greek philosophers, Orpheus and Pythagoras and, and some others, they have this shamanistic um, error about them. And you'll see when we start reading what I mean. This is a tradition that goes back to the Stone Age tradition of animism and, and nature worship and you know imagining that the world is imbued with with spirit and so 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 are you imbued with spirit and there's some way of communicating communing with them or, or maybe maybe all of these souls belong to some single soul some world soul some great spirit this idea this idea is everywhere in shamanism so he says a central concept of the Pythagoreans was arithmos. So of course, arithmos means number. That's where we get the word arithmetic, of course. He says they were gripped by the numinosity of numbers and experienced them as divine. The Pythagoreans had a similar experience when they realized that numbers exist as separate entities that one can manipulate. For the Pythagoreans, Number is the arche, the primordial stuff of the universe. All right, so when he says that the Pythagoreans saw numbers as numinous, as spiritual, as, you know, mysterious, does that resonate with you? He, the Pythagoreans saw numbers as divine. Can you imagine why that might be? All right, let me give you one. He said that the Pythagoreans had an experience with numbers that they exist as separate entities. What does he mean by that? So I'll give this to you like this. Let's imagine you've got four coconuts. And next to that, you've got four stones. And you say, look, we've got four coconuts, four stones. And then you're asked to remove the coconuts and to remove the stones. And then you're asked, where is the number four? So the idea here is that numbers mean quantities, and we know that. But numbers aren't necessarily connected to quantities. I can have four coconuts. I can have four stones. They aren't the same thing, but they're both four, right? There's something about true sense.
And even if I take the things away that are being counted, the question is, does four as a concept still exist? See, four is not attached to the objects. Four can exist all by itself. Where does that exist? How is the hair standing up on your arms? Where does it exist? There is an existence there, clearly, but it's not attached to the physical world. Now it exists, but somewhere else. What the fuck does that mean? It exists somewhere else in the spirit world and the world of forms, as Plato will say, uh, you know, shortly after this, this person lives, Pythagoras. So now you have this idea, oh, okay, that's why it's numinous. That's why it's spiritual. It has a reality that isn't physical. It has a reality that is eternal. That's weird. There's something divine about that, isn't there? So now you can see why the Pythagoreans believe that Arithmos was the Arche. And then I would, I would suggest to you that number isn't really what's meant here by the Arche. What's meant by number is something like information, right? We think, think about that in, in computing and in simulations today, it makes a lot, a lot of sense. The idea that information is what lays behind reality. It's the RK. It's the thing that was used to build up all of the world. It's the thing from which the world emerges, information. There's a lot of computer scientists and simulation theorists and, and you know, neuroscientists that would, that would write you know, books on that subject. What is information? Ones and zeros, right? What is that? I don't know, but we can we can simulate reality with it. That's pretty damn numinous, isn't it? Now he says, Jung said, quote, there's something mysterious about numbers. Numbers contain the whole of mathematics and everything yet to be discovered in this field. The opposition between the human world and the higher world is not absolute. For between them stands the great mediator, number, whose reality is valid in both worlds as an archetype in its very essence. All right, so there's, there's a lot here, but Young is saying numbers are mysterious. Numbers contain all of mathematics in them, even before they've been discovered. So Here's another element of numinosity that we, that's important to talk about. The moment you come up with the, with the idea of number, the moment you come up with the distinction between zero and one, let's say, implicit in that is the idea that you can, ha that you can add another, that if there's a difference between zero and one, there must be other differences. If you can go from zero to one, you must be able to go to another one. And what do we call that? We call that two. The moment you know that one and one meant two, then you get three. Because that's, not only do you get three as a concept, but you also get addition as a concept. And on and on and on you go. You're going to come up with every number all the way to infinity. You're going to, you're going to determine the relationships between numbers. You're going to determine addition, subtraction, multiplication, matrices, sets, and on and on and on and on you go. Everything is there already. All of mathematics exists already in the concept of zero and the concept of one. Isn't that amazing? And there's this, a long-lasting argument in, in philosophy. Was mathematics invented or discovered? So think about that for a while. If, if Jung is right, and you follow me, that all of mathematics is implicit in the idea of number, then mathematics pre-exists its discovery. And that's very numinous, isn't it? And then he says something that I alluded to earlier, where he says that number is something that bridges uh, the human world to the to the higher world, to the spiritual world. And he says it's a bridge. Why is it a bridge? Because numbers are valid in both worlds. Remember, when I say I have four coconuts in the physical world, that's a valid piece of information. But if I take the coconuts away and ask where the number four exists, it still exists and is still valid right in my mind. Is it not? That is not a physical place up here, is it? It's something else. 
And that is evidence for some numinous, some reality that exists apart from what we think reality is. That's that unconscious part. He says the Pythagorean's fundamental conception was that somehow the secret of the world is to be found in number. As represented in the, um, oh man, I'm going to mispronounce this word, Greek word, um, tetra, tetra, tetractus, tetractus, something like that, tetractus. That is a triangle image made of points. And this was a, a key symbol to the Pythagoreans. So the top of the triangle is one point. Geometrically, it represents position. One point on the grid it represents position. And there's two points underneath that. So two points represents a line, which is position plus direction. It's a one-dimensional dim entity, a line. Three points are going to be right underneath those two points in the triangle diagram. Three points define a plane, position and direction, plus breadth, a two-dimensional entity. Adding a fourth dot, now we have four points underneath that. Adding a fourth to the plane produces a three-dimensional entity, a solid, which represents position, magnitude, breadth, and depth. So you have all of this kind of packed into this image of a triangle made of dots. One, two, three, four. He says these early formations are not only valid for the external world, but are also the projection of pure psychology. They represent the sequence of psychic development. So initially, there is one point, non-dimensional. It's transcendent entity. The second point corresponds to the beginning of will, which includes the phenomenon of movement. The addition of the third point corresponds to the formation of mental images, still of a two-dimensional nature. Finally, with the fourth point, forms a three-dimensional entity, solidifying all previous factors into an ego. All right, so what Edinger has done is he's taken Pythagoras' explanation of numbers and how this one, two, three, four sequence can, can be used to illustrate dimensionality and, and how it builds on, on themselves to create the world around us, to go from a point to a line to a plane to, to a three-dimensional world. The same exact logic works if you overlay that onto the development of the psyche. You begin with this original point, this original consciousness, consciousness that emerges from unconsciousness. And you add to that this, this, this ability of having a will, this be standing alone and having a will. Then you add to that this the ability to form mental images. And then you add to that a unifying factor that pulls all of them together. And that's the ego. That's what we know of as our conscious reality. And so the same model is, is, is used to describe the world, but also the psyche. And so you can see a parallel there, again, between the world out there and the psyche. And he says, this formulation can be seen as completely justifying the numinous quality that the Pythagoreans attached to the Tetractus. Another Pythagorean concept is anantia, referring to opposites. With the appearance of the opposites, the world was rent asunder, and space was created for the growth of the human ego. The image of the separation of opposites is the Egyptian cosmology of Geb and Nut, initially in a state of perpetual cohabitation, but being pushed apart by their sun until a bubble is created between the sky and the earth this is, the, this is the Egyptian story. Geb and Nut get separated. So heavens and earth get separated from each other. Same thing happens in the biblical story. Heaven and earth get separated. Same thing happens in the Babylonian story. Tiamat and Absu. They get separated by Marduk, by, by their son. And the space in between is, is now available to be inhabited by consciousness. And in fact, that's exactly who, what Marduk represents, the god of consciousness with eyes all around his head. He can see everything, right? So you have the same story in mythology. And he just says, psychologically, there is space for human consciousness to exist when the opposites are consciously separated 
and perceived as separate entities, right? The separation of subject and object. He says the Pythagoreans also held to the notion of koinonia, which means fellowship, but in an interesting way. He says the experience of the numinosium in a common context can weld people together. Their collective experience becomes the container for the self. That's the Jungian self. It's the idea of God. So what he's saying here is that there is a communal sharing of the unconscious. Like, I'm unconscious, partly. So are you. Well, neither of us have any attachment. We, we don't have any direct consciousness of it. That's why we call it unconscious. And so we don't have any way of knowing that my unconscious is any different than yours. And Jung had an idea for this. He called this the collective unconscious. What the Pythagoreans said is that that fellowship, that thing that unites us all, this unconscious experience, this unconscious part of our, of our being that connects us all, is something that we use as a container for projections of, of our unconscious. And so it's like we identify with our greater community through a shared experience of, of the unconscious. Um, this, would, this would be something like saying that in, in ancient times, saying that a tribe or a people have the same God. That means they're unified somehow. They're unified in terms of their, their stories about how they believe the, the universe was created and how they were created. They're unified in what they think is moral. And all that stuff rolls up to how they imagine God. And they, and they, you know, accept and believe that is God. And that that's the, the common origin for the people, right? God created the people. They all came from it. And this container is for our unconscious projection. So imagine the God that we worship as a community, the, the God that we all agree is God. We all project the things that we don't understand or, or, or we're not conscious of. We project that onto this idea of God. And because we share the unconscious and we share this idea of God, we're unified by it socially. And I think that's really interesting. It makes me think of religion differently. It also makes me think of the lack of religion in the modern day as more troubling. So we don't have anything to unify us, you know? And that helps us to identify with each other. So it seems to me like community breaks down if we don't have a common container for our psychological projections, if we don't have a common God, if that makes sense. And that brings me to Heraclitus. Heraclitus was born in Ephesus right around 500 BC, happens to be Jung's favorite philosopher. Uh, let's get into Heraclitus. Edinger says, several significant ideas come down to us from Heraclitus. One is pyrazun, which means ever-living fire, which for Heraclitus is the arche. He describes this fire as an intelligence and the cause of the management for the universe. He says, quote, the world, neither any god nor any man made but it was always and is and will be fire ever living. All things are an exchange for fire, and fire for all things, as goods are for gold and gold for goods. The other elements are derived from fire. Whew, man, I love that. So, so he says that the world wasn't made, that it's always existed, that it's an expression of something that he's calling pyrazum, the, the, the fire ever living. And all things are made from that fire. You know, He says that you trade things for the fire like you trade gold for goods. That means that whatever the fire is can become all of the things that exist. That it's the arche. It's the thing that really exists behind the perception of the world. All of the things we see behind the scenes, past the veil, truth of them. Or that they are made of ever living fire. I don't know if you've ever watched a campfire. If you haven't, I suggest you do. It's one of the one of the best and simplest pleasures of being a human being. You sit and you watch the fire flicker and move and change color. 
And that's going to become important in a second because ever-living fire is something that's always transforming and moving. It's constantly reclining, though. While we're talking about ever-living fire, uh, Edinger says this conception is something like energy, right? Ever-living fire is something like energy as the basis of physis, as the basis of nature, the thing that's behind reality, making it work and moving it along. It's something like energy, this ever-living fire. And, you know, as we learned about energy, it cannot be created or destroyed. So the ever-living part makes quite a lot of sense. And it sounds like a modern idea. The editor says it corresponds to the psychological idea of libido. Like we have this psychic energy that, that keeps it, that's the animating quality that keeps us able to move and act in the world. It's like the energy behind reality that makes it work and allows for action and motion and interaction and all that. And I think there's a parallel to quantum co cosmologies, to quantum field theory. You know, that our most modern cutting edge science today believes that behind reality is something like quantum fields interacting and changing and transforming. It's ever living fire. Heraclitus connected the term logos with the concept of fire. So logos is an idea that became in Christianity something like the spirit of God, but it's also this ordering principle in nature and Edinger says logos is a multifaceted term. It means word, as we hear in the Bible, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. But it also meant reason, the rational principle of the universe, the order of the universe. He says Heraclitus was also well known for his doctrine of flux. In Greek, it's pantare, all things flow. That's what Heraclitus said. Everything is in a stage of becoming. Nothing is static. So he and Parmenides were in dispute over this question of change. According to Parmenides, the underlying nature of things is static. It doesn't move at all. According to Heraclitus, the exact opposite is true. Everything flows. And Edinger says, one must realize that neither philosopher is referring to concrete reality as experienced by the senses. They're talking about the metaphysical reality behind the sensible world, right? When Heraclitus says, no, whatever it is that exists really behind it, everything is something that's constantly transforming. And Parmenides says, no, whatever it is that's behind all things is the only thing in the, in, that exists that doesn't. It's the one thing that doesn't change. It's the static bedrock of everything. And Edinger's like, look, what's curious about this is not that they disagree. It's about what they're disagreeing about. They're, they're uh, both assuming that there is some single reality, some single thing that lies behind our perceptions, that lies behind the physical world. It's amazing. He says, we can see it as a conflict derived from the contrast between the ego and the self. The ego flows constantly. One is not the, in the same mood from one hour to the next. But the self transcends time and movement. Eternity is static. It is beyond the movement of time. When the self starts to incarnate in a particular ego, it is subject its, itself to change and transformation. So it, there's basically both the Parmenides and the Heraclitus things happening at once. You've got God or the self, which is the unmoved mover of Aristotle. It's the unmoved thing. It's the part of us that you might associate with the unconscious. It's the unchanging bedrock of being from which all consciousness emerges. But attached to that is the conscious part that is, that's created, that ego. That thing is always flowing and changing. And we can see that not only within ourselves, our maturing psychology, our expanding vocabulary, our are ex expanding, you know, uh, uh, experience of the world, um, you know, the graying of our hair and the wrinkles, everything's constantly changing, but so is the world. You know, evolution is driving the, the changing of the species. The, the, the natural forces are changing the tides and the, and the levels of the ocean and the shape of the 
continents and, you know, the spinning of the, it's all, right? It's all changing, except, except for that unconscious part, that bedrock part from which everything began. And you can't separate those two things. You've got a, you've got a union of opposites. You've got something that we talked about ad nauseum, this image of the Ouroboros, this very ancient image of God. It's the union of opposites, Tiamat and Apsu, the god and the goddess, the fresh water and the salt water, together. Now back to John Burnett. He said, Heraclitus believed himself to have attained insight into some truth not hitherto recognized, though it was staring men in the face. In two fragments, fragment 18 and 45, we gather that the many apparently independent and conflicting things we know are really one, and that this one is also many. And Philo says the same. He says, the world is at once one and many, and it is the tension of the opposites that constitutes the unity of the one. In Heraclitus, he said, men do not know how what is at variance agrees with itself. It is an attunement of opposite tensions, like that of the bow and the lyre. It's an interesting idea, the conscious and the unconscious, being and non-being, feminine and the masculine, potential and actual. Any set of opposites you can think of that, that constitute all of reality, when you put them together, when you imagine them together, Imagine that they're being held together by the tension of opposites, like the bow and the lyre. There's some harmony. There's some fundamental harmony that, that keeps them together. It's interesting. That brings me to Parmenides. Remember, Heraclitus and Parmenides didn't see eye to eye. Parmenides lived about 475 BC. He was from Alea, which, which is in southern Italy. And uh, we don't have a lot that survived from Parmenides, but we do have one short work. And Edinger tells us that in the prologue, it gives a fanciful account of a heavenly trip in which Parmenides comes to the celestial domain of the goddess who is to give him a revelation. So pop, stop there for a second. While we're thinking about these ancient Greek philosophers being shamans, this scene here, I mean, this scene here has got to be taken seriously. You've got this ancient Greek philosopher who comes up with his idea, his, his philosophy that we're going to hear about in a second, based upon his encounter with the goddess. So he gets a revelation from the goddess. Now, the idea of the goddess is interesting because there's lots of goddesses in ancient Greece, lots of goddesses all over the world. Um, but there's reason to believe that many of the, mo of the most important goddesses in classical mythology have an origin in a in a Paleolithic, uh, in a very ancient Stone Age goddess, like a Mother Earth type of figure that human beings worshipped, perhaps all over the world at, at around the same time where human beings existed. They had this idea of the creative womb of the Earth and uh, Mother Nature, and, and they, they imagined her as a goddess. And it's this goddess that Parmenides encounters, and he gets a revelation from her. And Edinger says, the theme shows that these early philosophers experienced their ideas as arising from divine revelation. So once we get past the prologue, we get to the next part. It's called the way of truth. And it states, quote, nor was it, nor will it be, since now it is all together, one and continuous. That it came from what is not, I shall not allow. So here we're talking again about the oneness behind reality. And he's saying that it's something interesting, something different. He's saying that it came from nothing I cannot allow. Right? Nothing comes from nothing. So Parmenides is saying that whatever this is he's getting at, this archaic that we're going we're gonna to get to, that it has always existed. It couldn't have been created. It's the thing that's uncreated. It's the reality that's fundamental, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't ever um, missing. It's always been present. It's the thing, it's fundamental reality, really. He says, when the word reality is substituted for the word it, the meaning starts to become more apparent. So let's do that. 
nor was reality, nor will reality be, since now it is all together one continuous. That reality came from what is not, I shall not allow. So if that makes more sense. What he's trying to say is, there's no such thing as non-existence. He says reality is, and it cannot be that reality is not. The term reality, you could also replace with the one, and you're going to get the same message. Nor was the one, nor will the one be, since now the one is altogether one continuous. That the one came from what is not, I shall not allow. Okay? So reality and God are indistinguishable in, in this way. And the point is, non-existence is not a thing. There is no such thing as non-existence. Never was, never will be. It's impossible. Either there is or there isn't. And because there is, it's always been that way. That's the fundamental thing. So what am I getting at? Well, we'll save it for a second. Let's get to the third part of the book. So we have the prologue, the way of truth, and now we have the way of seeming. And he, he says that it concerns the nature of the sensible world of visible appearances. And he says that it is false and deceitful. And so you have something that is reminiscent um, to Hinduism and Buddhism, this idea of maya or the world of perception being an illusion. And it also puts in contrast what we're seeking, the arche, that's behind reality, is different from what, what we see when we look at reality. So why am I making a distinction between reality and what is behind reality? I'm assuming there is something behind it that unifies it, that's responsible for it. That's the real thing. And what we're seeing, this glimpse of it that we're seeing, the world of perception, it's, it's, not, it's not true. There's something false and deceitful about it. So there was a philosopher, his name is going to escape me. Um, his name is going to escape me now, damn it. But what he said was that um, that consciousness is like a reducing valve. So you've got all this information pouring into you, and consciousness does the job of filtering out most of it so that we have only a flow coming through that's manageable for a human being. Like if we took that filter away, we would be overwhelmed with with you know, the sensation, we would be unable to even act or move. There'd be too much coming in. And so, so there's a distinction like that that Parmenides is making. It's like, it, it may not be possible for me to know what's really there behind perception, but there is a distinction between what's really there and what I'm perceiving. He says, the road to truth, so in Greek it's um, aletheia, the road to aletheia and the road to opinion, which is doxa, correspond to the archetypal level of the psyche and the, and the personal level of the ego. At the archetypal level, duality does not exist. There are no opposites. There is only the one. But as soon as a content reaches consciousness, it is split in two a phenomenon of the operation of consciousness. Cosmogonic myths begin in the same way, with the split of the original unity into two. Right? In the Bible, it's separating the heavens from the earth, or light from the darkness. And the ancient Babylonian story, it's separating Tiamat from Absu. And in Egypt, uh, Geb from Nut. It's the separation that occurs that allows for consciousness to, to exist. So the separation is creation. It's the creation of consciousness, but also the creation of the cosmos. He says, Aletheia and Doxa correspond to Plato's world of forms and ideas. So the world of forms and the world of ideas. Um, so, so Plato looks at the world around us and says, look, you have, uh, you have the things that exist here, you know, dogs and tables and chairs and so forth. And you have the form of them just like the numbers situation we talked about earlier. It's like you take away the objects that correspond to the numbers and you still have the idea of the number. He's saying the same, Plato says the same thing about forms or ideas. But, you know, you could have things that exist in your mind. Maybe you can have things that exist perfectly in your mind. 
that don't exist perfectly in the world, like a perfect circle. Um, or things that exist in your mind that don't correspond to things that exist in reality at all. Maybe a fantasy, maybe a dream. And so there's two different worlds that, that interpenetrate, and that's a mystery. And so this dichotomy, the endoxa, transcend the eminent between the potential and the actual, between the numinous and the, and the phenomena. This, this is the idea that will become later uh, Plato's idea forms. And that's the numinous reality that we've been toying with this whole time. Parmenides emphasizes the word being. He says, there is no such thing as becoming. There, there is no change, no passing away. There is only eternal being. The verb to be has astonishing numinosity. In the Old Testament, Yahweh gives his name, I am. Descartes, the philosopher, when trying to find some bedrock reality grounded his philosophy in, he said, I think, therefore I am. I'm conscious, therefore I am. So he's pointing, he's pointing to this idea of being, because this is what Parmenides is saying is the arche. It's being. Right? You can't, there's no such thing as non-being, is what he's basically what he's saying. Non-existence isn't a thing. The, the, the one thing that, that's fundamental that you can't get rid of, the one thing that must be the arcade where everything came from, is this idea of being. Reality, existence as such. And it has astonishing luminosity. And that brings me to my conclusion. I love the way Edinger laid this out. He tracks a hundred years of metaphysical development, capturing the synthesis of many minds by following their wrestling with just one basic idea, arche. What is the arche? That is the question. What was the first thing? From whence did reality arise? You can see how overlapping this question is to the realms of religion and of science. And both, of course, are birthed from it. And this brings us to Thales, our first philosopher, who believed the arche from which reality emerged was high door, or water. Water as an arche doesn't seem unreasonable, even to our modern mind. I mean, our bodies are, after all, composed almost entirely of water, and we couldn't sustain life without it. We see a similar asymmetry in the ratio of land to sea on our planet. It's mostly water. We believe that land emerged from the seafloor, raised by tectonic and volcanic activity, and that life crawled from the sea onto the land in the course of evolution. And as if that weren't enough, our earliest myths agree that the earth rose from the primordial sea and that the cosmos swims in the waters above, the waters of heaven, the stream of the Milky Way. We are also told of the waters of death, like the river Styx, which separate the realm of the living from the realm of the gods. But perhaps most compelling for me is the association of water with the unconscious. The myths of the river Styx and primordial ocean are, are relevant here. They illustrate the cloud of associations we place upon the mystery we call the unconscious. Like we cannot know the unconscious. Like we're, we're unconscious of it, right? That's the point. But when we try to contain its meaning, we form the following cloud. The abyss, the endless deep, the font, the dark place, the hidden thing, the place of hidden things place of great danger and potential, chaos and the unknown. And this cloud is represented by the image of water. Water takes any form. It separates things. And its dark depths conceal whatever your imagination can conjure. Like what's in the depths of the ocean? What's at the bottom? I don't know. Could be anything. 
it has the same meaning in myth and in dreams. But this conceptualization was inadequate for Anaximander, who believed the arche must be aperion or boundless. Whatever it is that gave rise to reality must somehow transcend reality. It must be infinite to have given itself of itself the finite. And this too accords well with the modern theist mind. Of course God is infinite, and for exactly the same reason. But Anaximenes wasn't satisfied with this new idea either. He sought in the Arche a connection between the infinite and the finite. And since Anaximander's Aperion doesn't seem to exist in reality, I mean, nothing real is boundless, he found a new symbol that seemed like the bridge. Air, Anaximander saw, as filling the cosmos, as it fills our lungs. It is necessary for life, and therefore necessary for reality itself. Further still, it was associated with the breath and the spirit, which leaves the body at death, giving us our first empirical evidence for reality apart from the physical. And there must be some reality apart from the physical, if we assume that the physical came from somewhere. Pythagoras took this idea of unconscious, boundless soul stuff and imagined it filling the cosmos like Anaximenes' air. He saw the multiplicity of the world as an infinite stream of representations animated by this mysterious arche. The idea of form as representation and container of an animating spirit came from the discovery of number in mathematics. Just as numbers are mental representations that serve as a container for meaning, physical representations too, like people and plants and stars, are exactly the same kind of container. What these containers are filled with is arithmos, number, or to put it in modern terms, information. Here Heraclitus steps in to reunify Pythagoras' arithmos, with Anaximenides' breath soul and Anaximander's boundless aperion. He sees Pythagoras' world of embodied information as an incarnation of ever-living fire. This fire is the soul stuff of Anaximenes and is the, is the infinite like Anaximander's air. It permeates and fills the world in an incarnation that brings order and intelligibility to reality. And lastly, as Heraclitus risks taking us again too far from the real world, Parmenides brings us back to the ground. He takes the ordering, life-giving, incarnating force of ever-living fire and attempts to remove the veil that conceals its truth. He acquaints us with the fire within by reminding us that we've known it intimately all along. He points to the intelligence within us, to the life that animates our bodies, to our very being, and says, that's it. That thing we call consciousness, psyche and soul. The thing we know is I am. That is the archaic.